Hi there and welcome to Typical Books. I'm Lydia and we're going to talk about the books that I read in March and my books that I'm going to be reading coming up in April. Now of course these are all horror books as usual. This is a horror channel. So I have also forgotten a book from last month that I just wanted to show off real quick and that is Cannibal Creator by Chad Lutsky. I'd forgotten that I read this book maybe because it's slim, maybe because I read it so quickly I, I was excited to read it and to get it because it looks so cool and I do love cannibal stories. So yeah, I read Cannibal Creator and I enjoyed it quite a lot. It's a very fun read. It's not very graphic. So judging from the cover, you may think that this is a roughy and this is an extreme or splatter story, especially because cannibalism sort of fits in there more often than not. And I wouldn't say it's a lighthearted, it's not a comedy or anything like that. But it is, you know, just a straight up little horror novel, very reminiscent of like 80s horror where it's sort of light, kind of pulpish. And I think that's the feeling that he was going for. And I think that it's been achieved. It's a really fun little cannibal book that isn't too extreme. I'll have to note, like other reviewers, that it is very sensitive to uh, equality and diversity. So this particular book is not going to be one of those that pushes an envelope or pushes too many buttons where you wouldn't want to be reading about discrimination, which often can be found in books about cannibals when it is them stranded on an island because they are stranded on an island. I can't think of a book off the top of people being stranded in a, a Northern American Canadian island that deals with cannibalism. If you know of any books that are maybe like Wendigo stories, let me know. On to what I read last month, as noted in my previous video, I had read Hetty by Eddie Generous. This is Behemoth Risen by Eddie Generous, and it's a short novella. It's very fun. It's very good. He's back in Canada this time, and I enjoyed it immensely. A group of people from a cult go into the forest to perform a ceremony, and it is to call on the behemoth. I, I think the, the, the cover does a really good job of not spoiling anything and also letting you know what you're in for. Behemoth, quite a bit of it. And meanwhile, there's a park ranger that has been called to investigate some of these uh, noises and, and creatures and, and missing people. And all the while, he's dealing with his dog who is not doing very well. And it is a little sad in that way, not sad to the point of Jack Ketchum Red sad, but it is a thread through this. And I really enjoyed that richness and that overlapping of these two stories where there is an immense loss of human life, like any good horror novel, but it's this man's best friend that really hits home. Really good book. The ending was quite startling and I really enjoyed that quite a lot. It packs a lot into such a short package. And again, it's that Eddie Generous style that I like so much that it is, you know, common language. These people feel like someone has walked a mile in their shoes already and they come across as very real, distinct personalities. And I really like that sort of writing. Even the more unsettled individuals in this book. I mean, uh, it's not a cult I would want to join, that's for sure. But it is, it does, you get the feel in very little room very little space taken up on the page by getting the personalities and the intricities of these social connections these people have forged over years as members of this cult. We don't even spend a lot of time with them talking about this, but we get that sense. It's quite economical. So that's what you want in a novella, right? Very good stuff. I had also received an advanced reader copy of Spontaneous Human Combustion by Richard Thomas. This was the beginning of a little bit of a gritty spell for me and I enjoyed this and it was a good segue into the next book I read because it is just all very dark. There's a lot of maybe depression, hopelessness, people with regrets in this book and whether they work out or not, it is also very dark and demonic in a lot of places. Now the very last story, Ring of Fire, is a novella. So 13 short stories and the 14th story is this longer piece novella and I enjoyed that quite a lot. My next favorite story in this is called Notice Tollins. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that, but it is a story about gambling. And we have recently here in Canada, maybe not just Ontario, opened up some sort of, with the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Commission type thing, 
uh, online gambling is now state sponsored or provincially sponsored. And it's very scary to a lot of people who know that there's a lot of people susceptible to that sort of addiction. And this story really played into that because it's like the new moral panic this week, right? So Notice Tollins was a really well-written story and I enjoyed it in its kind of monkey's paw sort of way. Very simple story, very simple three act sort of thing. And you get to see this progression of this um, thing within this guy's life where he is given a bit of a wager and given his sort of uh, Aladdin's lamp, so to speak. And it all goes terribly wrong, of course, because it is horror after all. Spontaneous Human Combustion is a really good dark collection. If you're new to Richard Thomas, I had known him as the editor of the anthology, The New Black from quite a few years ago that I enjoyed a lot. So I was really happy to read some of his work. So yes, highly recommended. As I'd said, the Richard Thomas book set me up for even more darkness to come with Matthew Lyons, A Black and Endless Sky. This is gritty and I've said it on Patreon. If you're a Patreon member, you may have already heard me talk about this. This was one of my top picks as far as my five favorite things this month, last month, but I wish I could write like this. This is the sort of characters that I would love to write, intrinsically unlikable, uh, with some traits that they're trying to work on. They have some regrets, they have some mistakes, and they are not 100% angelic people by a long shot, but they have tried to work on these things or they've repressed them and they're bubbling to the surface. So I really enjoy that kind of dynamic with these people. And it is a brother and sister. See, the thing I like about say the Jeepers Creepers movie is that it's this brother and sister having to go up against this monstrous force. And we get this, this is a brother and sister on a road trip after the brother has suffered a, a pretty amicable divorce, but a soul crushing divorce nevertheless, he's moving home and she's driven across country, days across country to pick him up and take him home. So they're trying to return to Albuquerque from, I guess, somewhere on the East Coast. And it is a horrible road trip. It is a hellish road trip. There is hell on their ass in the form of a biker gang that they have wronged and other forces. It is a dark and devastating, violent and demonic story that is just very dark, very gritty. And I really enjoyed it a lot. I read it quite quickly. So I may be rereading this in the years to come because I did enjoy this road trip for all of its horrific stuff. And it has a very, very fulfilling ending where it's not like everything gets righted at the end at all, but uh, yeah, it's very fulfilling. So I'd like to see more from Matthew Lyons, especially with this gritty stuff. I hadn't read his previous novel and I should. You may have noticed on my Instagram where I've posted some like lines that really stayed with me after reading these books. And it's something that I'm gonna to continue to do because it's something that I've wanted to do for quite some time. I just being lazy and I had first thought I would take a photo of the line and I've done that before, but that's a lot like work. It's so much easier to, you know, wait after I've read a book, kind of digest it and then go back to find these lines that really summed up the feeling of the book for me. And there are a, quite a few lines like that. And the one that I chose is a moment when someone kind of sees the big picture. And there's a lot of moments in that when people are alone and they get to really think about what's going on and they're sort of wool gathering a little bit. And it's it's when the story gets the darkest, I think, or when these characters are alone and you're alone with them and you get to see their innermost thoughts. Very dark. There's also a book on my Kindle, Darcy Coates Hunted. I don't know much about this, but it seems like a, a break from Haunted Houses, which is a lot of what Darcy Coates is known for and a lot of what I love about her writing. I love a good haunted house and she writes them. Very picturesque, gorgeous, gothic mansions or with some modern weird little conveniences built into these vast places that she usually writes in. Talk about a vast place, lost in the forest, hunted is this new to me Darcy Coates. I'm not even sure how old it is, but it caught my eye and I scooped it up immediately. Yeah, Hunted is also on my list. One of my bridge books, incidentally, will be The Sorrows of Young Huerta by Goethe. I have not finished reading it. Not that it was too dark or anything or like sad or depressing like it's a, a reported to be, but uh, I got excited about other books instead. So I'll return to that. But speaking of bridge books, Sundial by Katrina Ward is my bridge book. It was the patron pick for last 
month as well. And again, it is very dark. This is a very different tone though. And we're spending a lot of time with less characters. Right now we're spending a lot of time with the daughter Callie and her mother Rob. And I'm really enjoying this story of Rob's childhood home in an estate or compound, more like it in the desert, called Sundial. That's the name of the house, like High Hopes in Amityville. Sundial is the name of this house and it does have a human sundial. My hometown has one as well down at the waterfront where you can stand in a spot and then look at the bricks down there and it will tell you what time it is. It's pretty it's pretty cool. I like it a lot. Uh, you'll notice maybe my little tiny springtime bookmark. It is a little tiny silicone sprout that sits and it grips in really well to the book. So it's one of my favorite springtime bookmarks. So do you have seasonal bookmarks? I don't know if it's just me that has seasonal bookmarks. I'm sure we all have some Halloweeny ones, but we might use them all year round. I've got a little sprout. So yeah, sundial. Uh, <laughs> the sprout kind of belies it. The cover with all of its color belies what's going on here. Uh, really dark story to begin with of a woman who is in um, sort of a coercive control sort of relationship with her husband. She's kind of putting her foot down or taking the steps toward putting her foot down, which involves putting your foot down. Yes, I realize, but she is going to put her foot down. I, I'm sure of it. I'm only, you know, maybe a third of the way in the book right now. Uh, it's riveting. I love Katrina Ward's writing. I really enjoy The Last House on Needless Street, which was a book that I read last month as well. So yeah, really like this writing style. I really like this very punchy and very economical, a lot of short sentences, not a lot of fluff, but also in the way that Kathy Koja or maybe Chuck Palahniuk writes this sort of observational uh, sentence fragments sort of style. I'm not even really sure what you call that, but it is this punchy, economical, dry, very raw writing style that takes this domestic situation to a new level. Oh, and did I mention that her daughter is fixated with bones and dead things? She's a little baby Dahmer, right? So I am enjoying that angle very much as well. So on to April and what I'm going to be reading in April. The March-April issue of Rumor Magazine is in. I haven't even read it yet. I skipped through to read like the Ninth Circle or the uh, Library of the Damned, that section. So I did skip in to read about the books that are mentioned in this magazine, like I always do every single month. But yeah, I've yet to read this. I may take it with me. I'm going on a little, little vacation, so maybe I'll read it over vacation. Speaking of which, because I'm not going to have so much time to read this month. I've only picked three books and I'll have a patron pick coming up soon. There was quite a few books that caught my eye in the big list of books that are coming out this month. Not only from Horror Writers Association authors, there's quite a few of those, but at typicalbooks.com slash new horror, I'll have a link in the description. I've listed all the books that caught my eye. And from there, I'll choose a few. And as of today, there will be a poll up on Patreon for bookworms to vote on what book they think I ought to read this month. So in addition to that, there's these three books. The Cellar by Richard Lehman. I've seen that Juan is reading this too. I'm slowly going to go through my Richard Lehman collection and be adding to it on every book buying shopping trip. I'm going to be adding the few titles that I'm missing from my Richard Lehman collection to finally flesh it out. But The Cellar, I'm going to start there. It's a logical place to start. And I've read it before, but I haven't read it in a long time. So I'm looking forward to getting into this and I'm also looking forward to hear what Juan has to say about it. So yeah, check out Plagued by Visions. Yeah, Richard Lehman, someone had come under fire not too long ago on Twitter for enjoying some Richard Lehman. So I really hope that we can all be cool and, and read some old throwback slasherific and really inappropriate 80s horror. And being from 1980, exactly, that is like the beginning of it all, right? If you're gonna say 80s horror, it's a 1980 novel. So it's probably gonna be horrible. Even older than that, 1966, The Psycho. This is a book now by Phillips Moore. This was a book that I had owned at one point and I read it. It's a slim little weird pulp book from the 60s and it is a psychological story. And I remember most of it takes place in a psychiatrist's office speaking to this psycho, a self-professed psycho, who has also envisioned this subcast system of humans and who he will and will not deal with. 
and dealing with people in terms of the superhuman and the subhuman and where he categorizes people. So it was like a very hate filled book and I remember not liking it. And now I can't remember though, did I not like it because it wasn't written well? Did I not like it because it was not a conceivable reality for me? Did it overstep as far as psychoanalysis? I'm uncertain. Or did I not like it because it just wasn't good? Did I not like the character? That doesn't sound like me. I like I, and I accept reading some pretty deplorable people. So I don't know if he'd be this deplorable. By far the most frightening book of this or any year. So I, I hope that still holds true. The Psycho Speaks, the back copy says. Doctor, I am at peace because I shall soon fulfill my destiny. And what is your destiny? The young man smiled patiently. To become God, Doctor. On the day after tomorrow I shall become God with the power and the right to take human life. To kill? The young man closed his eyes. On the day after tomorrow, Doctor. It did have an alternate title, Once Upon a Friday, which I can see why it had been changed. And I, I think that part of the marketing at the time when it was called Once Upon a Friday, people were confused about what it's about. And the psycho actually leaves no questions unanswered, much like other books of the title. Psycho, which I own quite a few of, come to think of it. But yeah, The Psycho. Looking forward to revisiting this weird little book and seeing if it is the most frightening book of this or any other year. And now for a book that I've been waiting to get to. This may be something that I read when I return from vacation so I can actually delve into it with my full brain. Because this is a book that was recommended to me by my husband when he read it. He said, not only does it remind him a lot of my writing style and styles of authors that we both really enjoy, it is Unpleasantness by Nathaniel A. Giles. Now I love this cover. Uh, I'll put a shot up so you can see it in its glory. Very simplistic. I love when people pay very close attention to typography and how it interacts with the images. So this is very well designed. Ghost stories for the depressed. This sounds like something I'll enjoy immensely and not something I'll want to read while going into um, like a holiday mindset, a little bit of time away from work. Uh, this, is, this is something that I'll definitely want to read on a weekday after work, during work, on my lunch. Unpleasantness, ghost stories for the depressed. Challenges the notion of the ghost story itself. Two deceased workers haunt an office until turnover and management decisions erase all memory of them. A woman is driven into a life she never wanted by a vision of her future self. A man sees a ghost, but just for a second, and it ruptures his already distorted worldview. A convict acquires second sight and uses it for profane purposes. A desperate young man is compelled to steal by ghosts that are altogether absent. In his brilliant debut collection, Nathaniel A. Giles retrofits a ghost story for the 21st century and in doing so pushes the boundaries of the genre and questions whether this century isn't already bad enough without ghosts. So yes, it is pretty damn bad. I think ghosts would improve our situation to a certain extent. So yeah, looking forward to this. Mr. Giles was also a teacher, so I'm looking forward to that sort of uh, writing that I no doubt you've noticed quite a few horror authors are also teachers or were teachers or have an MFA in English literature or something like that. And that just usually lends itself to someone who can construct sentences in, in the most florid way. And I look forward to that. Being an uneducated bumpkin myself, I have a special appreciation for those who have invested so many years in learning our wonderful and varied language and using it to write horror ghost stories and deplorable things. A tiny aside, it is not necessarily teaching related because I'm not teaching news design for journalism anymore, but the newest edition of the newspaper hit the shelves after two years. After two years, like that's one of those markers. I'm sure we have them all. Like we haven't gone out to eat without a mask on in two years, or we haven't seen our families for two years, or haven't taken our dog to the dog park or whatever it is that you haven't done because of the pandemic. And that could be a really long list. But one thing that a lot of people in journalism and print media haven't done is published a paper issue of something in quite some time. 
So yeah, I was really glad to see that on the shelves. I had helped do the graphic design for that. So I'm doubly proud for my own reasons in that because seeing something tangible come out of your computer these days is a rarity. So I really, really liked that. So congratulations to that team of journalists and advertising students. There will be one more book coming from the patron pick, of course. I don't know what that will be, but on the 15th, when the polls wrap up, I will be buying that book as well post haste. So I'm glad that there's some like little bite sized stuff. I have a feeling though that the Darcy Coates book will be my bridge book because I don't know how much time I'll have to read on an ebook or that could be all that I read while traveling. So if there's anything on that list that you've already read, let me know in the comments below or if there's anything that you think I ought to be reading next month, definitely let me know. Thank you so much for watching and have an ooky spooky day. Thank <laughs> you.